Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, compassionatecooks.com. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. Great to be here. First and foremost, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Laurie Farner, who I had the great pleasure of meeting last year, I think it was. She was one of the participants in Dr. McDougall's program, and I teach for Dr. McDougall a couple times a month. It's about an hour from here in Santa Rosa, and she was just so lovely and so generous and so wonderful and sweet. She was already vegan when we met, but she's been a supporter of my work since then, and we've become friends via email. It's really amazing to me. I, I feel like I have a relationship with so many of you. I wish I could take more time to communicate with you, but but that's what's been so nice about the message board. I feel like I'm introducing all of my friends to one another, and it's just great to see all of you connecting. You know that feeling when you're introducing friends of yours, each of whom you love, but who have never met each other and you get really excited because you want your friends to meet and then they do and they hit it off. That's what it feels like. It's watching all of you connect on the message board since I know you and I know how wonderful all of you are. I love just watching all of you connect with each other. So it's really fantastic. So do, do check out the message board and register for it and just get involved and just meet all the fantastic people out there listening to this podcast so anyway, Lori is today's sponsor, and I'm very grateful to her. When I thanked her for her sponsorship, she wrote that it's always my pleasure to promote and support you and Compassionate Cooks only seems fair given how big a pleasure I derive from reading your blogs and listening to your podcasts and whipping up your scrumptious chow. So thank you, Lori. I look forward to seeing you again. I'll be seeing you soon at a talk I'll be giving in your town or near your town. I know you're traveling to come to the event, so I look forward to seeing you very soon and I will give you a big in-person thank you when I see you next week. I can't believe it's next week. So I'll see you very soon and thank you again for your podcast sponsorship and thank you to all who have supported this podcast. If you'd like to help me continue to use this medium as a way to raise awareness and empower people, I would be most grateful for your support. You can become a sponsor by visiting compassionatecooks.com and clicking on support our podcast. If you're not comfortable doing it over the internet, you can certainly send a check. The address is on the website and thank you for anything you can do to help. One of the things I want to say about the message board too, by the way, is as I said, it's getting harder and harder for me to be able to reply to you via email individually. And I wish that wasn't the case, but it's just harder for me to do. I also have to watch how much time I spend on the computer because I do wind up working too much on it and getting wrist pain and, and pain in my hands. And it's kind of scary. So I'm trying to cut back on email as much as possible. And it's very difficult for me to do because I want to reply to each and every one of you when I get your lovely emails. But if you have very specific questions, especially things that you think other people would be able to answer about food or nutrition or animals or just really anything related to what we talk about, I really encourage you to ask your question on the message board so that other people can not only reply to your question and help you directly so that you get your question answered, but also because if you're asking that question, chances are somebody else has that same question. And by putting it out on the message board, other people can see the answer. So it's really a way to spread information and really increase the amount of resources that we put out there on the message boards. So people can use it as a resource for other information. So I do encourage you to use the message board for that kind of thing. Now, the first episode I did on my five favorite foods was quite a while ago, so I thought it was time to expand that list. And when I say favorite foods, I suppose the criteria are what I eat frequently, at least several times a week, what I love to cook or prepare for whatever reason, you know, just because I love to eat the food or just because it's easy to prepare or what have you, um, and what I really feel good about eating. So, you know, I have a lot of favorite foods, a lot of foods fit that criteria. And with the second list of five favorites, it should not negate the first five at all. Let's just say I have a lot of favorites and I like lists a lot. I make lists 
lists every day of things I need to accomplish, of errands I need to run, of things I want to write, of podcast episodes I need to create, food I need to buy, a lot of lists. I make a lot of lists. I recently refreshed my favorite movies list. I'm a total dork. I spent some time going over my list of favorite films and people ask me all the time what my favorite films are and I thought it was just time to update that list. So I've said before that I watch a lot of films. It's my drug and I've always been a crazy film lover and it's what I do when I finally sit down to relax that and read and spend time with my husband and my cats. And my husband now shares my fondness for film, which is great. So it's something that we share together And so it's wonderful to be able to share that with him. We definitely speak the same language when it comes to film. And just as my absolute favorite films remain strong, it doesn't mean that something doesn't come along and become an obsession for a while, a film that alters the list slightly. It's the same thing with my favorite foods. Things are always changing. Things are always shifting. And so what I may have eaten every day a year ago may be every other day now, but Don't come to me five years from now and say, but I heard you say that you eat X every day and now you're telling me you don't. So what's up with that? Okay, I'm in flux. We're all in flux and things change and you got to keep up. Anyway, so write your list or use my list as a guide, whatever. But these are just some foods that I want to share with you because I like them. But it's it's true when I say that humans are ridiculous creatures of habit. People who say people who say to a vegan, but what do you eat? As if they're eating a huge variety of foods really haven't taken stock of their repertoire. We all need to refresh our repertoire and do it consciously and happily and willingly. Personally, I would be embarrassed if a movie that was my favorite movie 20 years ago was still my favorite movie today. I don't know, maybe. I mean, the whole point is that we change, right? I mean, we're supposed to evolve. We're supposed to grow and expand our horizons, expand our tastes in film, in art, in literature, in music, in entertainment, in food. I don't know. That's just kind of how I see it. It's just a matter of trying new things and being open and allowing our taste buds to expand. So that's my main criterion. Things I eat or consume, in the case of green tea, which I drink, on a regular basis. And though I may have shifted my repertoire a bit since that last episode of my five favorite foods, all of those foods and beverages, in the case of green tea, are still things that I eat regularly and still love. And that's what I want to share with you today. More foods that I love and and how to prepare them. Now, I imagine we'll get into some more exotic foods someday, but frankly, in the many years I've been doing this work, I have learned that even the most basic foods are still foreign to people. Take something like carrots, one of the foods on my list. I think the carrot is underrated and misunderstood, and it might seem like a pretty pedestrian and food to have on my list. But according to my criteria, it's got to be here. I eat them pretty much every day. Carrots are just fantastic raw and they're fantastic cooked. And I eat them in one form or another almost every day. Boring though they may seem, they're worth talking about. So that brings me to my list. Carrots, oats, walnuts, dates, and Brussels sprouts. All right. So these are my next five favorite foods. So let's talk about carrots. First, since we're already on the subject of carrots, I love carrots. I love, love, love carrots. Now, I know you already know how healthful they are. They're full of antioxidants. Their wonderful orange color should be a clue to that fact, to the fact that they're full of antioxidants. And I'm sure you can guess which antioxidants that orange color belies. Beta carotene, right? You've heard of beta carotene. Um, Beta carotene is also found in beets, in sweet potatoes, and in other yellow orange vegetables. And beta carotene provides protection against cancer, especially lung cancer and bladder, breast, um, and stomach cancers. It provides protection against heart disease and the progression of arthritis by as much as 70%. So we definitely want to get lots of beta carotene in our diet. But I do want to say something about beta carotene, which is, you know, a form of vitamin A. I've said before that I do recommend a multivitamin just as insurance, you know, and nothing really more than that. 
except for perhaps a B12 supplement, which is often in a multivitamin. But you want to be careful not to add a lot of other supplements to your diet. You don't want to add, you know, extra vitamin A or beta carotene or extra vitamin E, for instance. There's a lot of evidence that indicate that high amounts of these nutrients, high amounts of these vitamins, if you will, actually cause bigger problems, that they're toxic in high levels. So do yourself a favor and get the nutrients from the plant foods. You know, you don't want to be taking excess like folic acid unless you're pregnant, you know, and there's guidelines for that. You can check out Becoming Vegan for more specific guidelines. But you don't want to rely on supplements for your nutrients. You want to really rely on the foods for that. You know, folic acid that shares the same root as the word foliage. So where do you think you're going to get that folic acid from the foliage, from the plant foods? Okay, so when I talk about beta carotene, I'm talking about beta carotene from the vegetables themselves, from the carrots, from the sweet potatoes, etc. Now, there's a lot of talk about eating cooked food over raw food and raw over cooked and cooked is bad and raw is better. And I just think that we can talk about that ad nauseum. But my particular solution for that is to eat both, <laughs> you know, eat both raw and cooked vegetables. People often ask me how I feel about the popular raw food diets or living food diets, which for those of you who don't know, there are diets that specifically advocate eating only raw unprocessed foods or foods heated under 110, 120 degrees. So when people ask me, how do, how do you feel, Colleen, about eating raw food? I say, I feel really good about eating raw food. I think eating raw fruit and raw vegetables and sprouts are really good. So eat them. Do I think people should eat only raw food and never cooked food? No. I personally don't. And that's just my personal opinion. I'm not going to get into the debate as to my whys and wherefores, but I personally believe that a combination of both raw and cooked food makes for a healthful, varied diet, and it's really packed with all the nutrients we need. So that's my personal opinion. Now, how much raw food should we eat in proportion to cooked food? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't really like doing math when I eat. I actually don't like doing math at all. <laughs> so, um, but I don't want to do math when I eat. I don't, I don't measure my food. I don't weigh my food. I don't think about how many grams of this or that I'm getting. I just want to make sure that I get a huge variety of raw food. And I'm talking about raw vegetables, obviously, and, and cooked food and cooked vegetables, etc. If I had to guess, I would probably say that I eat about three quarters raw and a quarter cooked. I, I don't, again, measure, but I, I probably don't even eat any cooked food until dinner time unless I have oatmeal in the morning. I do think that people are not getting enough raw vegetables. So I think increasing the amount of raw vegetables uh, in your diet is a really good thing. Raw vegetables have a lot of fiber, a lot of fiber. And some people may find that when they increase the amount of raw fiber in their diets, they have, um, shall we say, more frequent visits to the loo. Some people find that the more raw fiber they eat means they lose weight, which can be a good thing. Some people find that if they're eating a higher ratio of, of raw food to cooked food, that they have less energy um, because it doesn't provide the same kind of energy that more complex carbohydrates give you. So I think that each person needs to find his or her own ratio of raw food to cooked food. And if you're just starting to to increase the amount of raw food in your diet and you're finding that it's causing you discomfort, maybe do it more slowly, but it's definitely not a good enough reason, you know, feeling any discomfort or making more frequent visits to the loo to not consume raw vegetables. There's just too many good things in these raw vegetables to not eat them. So I think a combination of both is a really good thing. I think early on when I first became vegan many years ago, I didn't want to fit into a stereotype of vegans eating salads all the time. So I think I ate fewer salads than I should have. And that's a lot different these days. I eat a lot of salads and I eat a lot of raw vegetables. I would say my lunch almost every day is a big, huge salad. And, you know, if you're hungry after a big, huge salad, that's fine. I mean, have more food. It's okay. But when I talk about a salad, I'm not just talking about leafy greens and some shredded carrots. I put in 
lots of vegetables, lots of carrots, lots of celery. I put in um, sun-dried tomatoes. I put in raw beets. I'll put in, you know, a can of beans, whether it's garbanzo beans or kidney beans. I'll put in tofu. Um, so I put in a, a huge amount of food into the salad. It sounds like, oh, just a salad, but it's not just a salad, okay? So have a salad or if it's, you know, if you need more food, then that's fine. What what feeds me might not be enough to feed you, but definitely getting in a salad, a nice big salad every day, whether it's for lunch or dinner, I think would be really I think would be really good. And I think that's where that glow comes from. There's a real glow that a lot of vegans have. And I think part of it is that it comes from the inside. Um, obviously, the radiance that comes from living in alignment with your values. But I also think it comes from the inside, from eating lots of healthful, raw foods. Because, you know, obviously, there can be people who are eating pretty unhealthy diets out there, vegan diets. But I'm talking about a whole foods, plant-based diet full of lots of of wonderful vegetables and carrots and other vegetables high in beta carotene literally do give you a glow. You get a bit of an orange glow. Um, some people may find that an increased consumption of carrots tints your skin a bit, like a like a little orange color, and you can kind of see it when you eat more of these um, beta carotene rich vegetables. I think it's a good sign that you're eating a healthful diet. If you compared your skin to someone who's eating a typical American diet full of animal products and processed foods, you will definitely look a lot healthier than they do. And again, I think that's where more that glow comes from. And by the way, I do want to just go back to what we were saying before. If you are experiencing more trips to the bathroom upon your transition to a whole foods, unprocessed vegan diet, there are lower fiber food choices that do help bind things a little better. So consider decreasing some of your raw vegetables a bit and focusing on things like cooked green beans, uh, cooked wax beans, cooked spinach, cooked pumpkin, cooked eggplant, cooked potatoes without the skin, cooked asparagus, cooked beets, cooked carrots. So you're, so you're getting all of the nutrients from the vegetables, but it's a little easier on your system to at least eat them in a cooked form while your body's still adjusting to all of that new fiber. Also soy milk and tofu and rice milk, almond milk and white rice. You know, it's true, but white rice doesn't have all that fiber from the from the bran, so it does help bind things. Couscous, because again, it's a pasta, um, pasta, nuts and fruit juices without the pulp, and lettuce and vegetable juice without the pulp. They're also really good for binding things. So I just want to make sure that you have that information while we're talking about fiber, because fiber really does just push things through, and it does increase the regularity that you have. I mean, it's just true, and that's the wonderful thing about getting fiber. People are not getting um, enough fiber in their diet, but it can also cause some discomfort. So just try to find a bit of a balance there. So back to carrots. This whole this whole point is about carrots. So um, so I eat carrots in the most obvious way. Uh, we've talked before about cutting vegetables up in advance and putting them in the refrigerator. And I'm telling you, if you cut them in advance and you just have them easily accessible so that you can just grab them and snack on them, they're fantastic and you will eat them. So cut them up and just eat them as a snack. It's an obvious obvious way to eat carrots, but I also cut them up and put them in my salad. And David and I um, each like our carrots cut differently for our salads. He likes his shaved, you know, just like using a vegetable peeler. And I like mine chopped, not in circles, but in not in large dices, but like chopped, like kind of small. And he gets in trouble when he makes me a salad and the carrots are too large or they're in circles. It's like, you can't do that. I can't have my carrots that way. The other way I eat carrots a lot is through carrot juice. Now, I mentioned fruit juice and vegetable juice without pulp to help bind things passing through. The pulp is obviously where some of the fiber is. The skin is where a lot of the fiber is. And the reason I men mentioned eating the vegetable juice and the fruit juice without pulp is because it decreases some of the fiber. So your body has an easier time adjusting to this to this fiber. Now my body does fine with raw fiber. I don't really have that problem. And I think your body does adjust over time. So for people who want to increase raw vegetables and increase the fiber in their diet, some experts may not recommend fruit and vegetable juices as a source of fiber. And they would be right in the sense that most fruit and vegetable juices have a lot of fiber removed in the extraction of the juice, right? And 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 I would say that's probably the case 
juice in a lot of commercial juices. I make carrot juice almost every day these days with my juicer. And what I do is I you know, put the carrots through and, and my particular juice is usually carrots, beets, um, ginger, uh, an orange, I usually put through some like a nectarine or a mandarin and an apple. And so I put these things through. And what happens is when you start to juice them, obviously all the pulp, all of the fiber comes out one end and the juice goes out another end. So you're getting the juice, but you're, you know, you're kind of like leaving behind all of this good stuff. So I just keep feeding it back into the juicer until it's virtually gone. And I've got a lot more juice, but now I'm getting a lot more fiber as well. So that tends to work if you want more fiber. If you don't want that much fiber, then obviously you wouldn't want to feed it back in. So you have all these options. It's just amazing how many options you have. The other thing you can do is if you do have all that fiber left over when you're juicing, I've often used that also f to make carrot cake or something like that or throw it in some muffins or whatever. So you can still use it. It's not like it has to go to waste, even though it wouldn't go to waste in our house because we do compost. So you'd be able to throw it in the compost bin too. So again completely sustainable, no waste, and you're getting all of this good stuff. So that's another way I consume carrots through my own carrot juice. My other favorite way to eat carrots is cooked in a soup. And just as my garlic and green soup is famous for its healthful deliciousness, so is my carrot ginger soup. I've been making the soup for years. And if you can't tell, carrots and ginger go really well together. And when I say ginger, I'm referring to fresh ginger root, not ground ginger powder. It's not the same thing, and you don't really use them interchangeably. The recipe for this soup, um, available, I believe, in the soups and stews packet, is that compassion at cooks.com and it's basically just a bunch of carrots a couple yellow potatoes some garlic a lot of ginger and a yellow onion and you just add enough water to cover all the vegetables add a bouillon cube a veggie bouillon cube if you want and you just cook it until the carrots and the potatoes are soft and then you puree it in a food processor or using a you know an immersion blender or a Vitamix blender and so I you know I have to say I was telling someone about I was talking I was doing a cooking class yesterday that's what it was and I was talking about ginger and how much I love ginger. And I had already written this particular podcast episode. And I talked about the fact that I've chosen, you know, my next five favorite foods. And I felt really guilty that ginger wasn't on this list. So why don't we just consider this my my six favorite foods? Because ginger is definitely something I eat every day. It's so wonderful. It's so good for you. I have a ginger tea in my cookbook. I have a few ginger things in the cookbook but it's just it's so fantastic it's so good for you it adds a wonderful flavor it adds so much nutrition and adds like a little heat because it's got like a bite a little bite to it so anyway so I felt guilty leaving out ginger so let's 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 call it six favorite foods and for what it's worth, uh, the appliances I just mentioned, the Vitamix blender, the hand immersion blender, and the food processor, I think they're each useful in their own way. Do I think you have to have fancy appliances to eat and cook healthfully? No. Do I think it helps? Yes. I love my KitchenAid food processor. People who take my cooking classes know that I rave about the KitchenAid food processor. I hate the Cuisinart food processor. I probably shouldn't say that in case Cuisinart wants to sponsor sponsor my podcast someday, but I would have to say no, you can't sponsor my podcast because I don't like your food processor. So I would have to turn them away because the KitchenAid food processor is so much better. Um, so if KitchenAid wants to sponsor this podcast, I'm happy to accept your sponsorship. But the KitchenAid food processor has a large bowl and a large blade and a small bowl and a small blade all in one machine. So it's really great to have on your counter, especially if you don't have a big kitchen, and it's really versatile. So anyway, so I love my KitchenAid food processor. You'd be able to find this, for instance, on my store through Compassionate Cooks. You go to Stock Your Pantry, or there's lots of links off to my Amazon store, and you can see exactly which model I recommend. And, and you can see the size, and you can get different colors of the food processor or whatever you want. And so I do like the KitchenAid food processor for, you know, for chopping, for dicing, for slicing, and it's good for pureeing. But for instance, the soup I just mentioned, it would do fine in the large bowl of the food processor. But if you really want 
like a really silky, smooth, creamy soup. The Vitamix blender is also fantastic. Now I use the blender pretty much only for making smoothies, for making nut butters or nut milks, but it's also really good for silky soups. But I wouldn't chop an onion in the Vitamix blender, for instance. So you see what I mean? There's, you know, kind of different purposes for each appliance. And I don't have a big kitchen, but these are appliances I use every single day. And it's worth it to have them on my counter. I get a lot of bang for my buck out of these appliances. And you can find these in the store, for instance. And then there's, of course, that immersion blender, which is pretty inexpensive. And it's just something where when you want to puree the soup right in the pot, you'd put this immersion, it's also called a wand blender or a hand blender, you'd put it right in the pot, and you can puree the soup like that. And it's really convenient. It's really easy to clean. It's also great for just pureeing part of the soup and then not the rest of it so that you thicken it up like a soup or a stew, but you leave it kind of chunky too. So anyway, all of these things are in the Compassionate Cook store. And, and actually, we even started a new forum on the message board that talks about people's favorite gadgets in the kitchen. So that's another place to go to as a resource. So anyway, and then, of course, carrots are wonderful for making desserts, such as carrot cake. And I do have a carrot cake in the Joy of Vegan Baking cookbook, along with the cream cheese frosting and lots of other desserts in that cookbook, obviously. But carrots are a great way to add moisture and, of course, fiber to baked goods. Um, and it also adds sugar, too. I mean, you know, carrots are sweet and they've got a lot of sugar. And so it's a great way to add some sweetness to a baked good as well. Don't underestimate the sweetness of fruit and vegetables. Once you really focus your diet on whole foods, you'll notice that an apple tastes sweeter than anything you could have imagined. But you need to first get out the corn syrup and the high fructose corn syrup and the processed packaged foods out of your diet, out of your palate, to really appreciate the sweetness of vegetables, even carrots. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean you can't indulge in desserts once in a while. But my point is that the, the, the less you eat, the more you really notice the natural sugar in fruits and vegetables. Okay. So I don't know, I could probably say more about carrots, but I'm going to move on to dates. And that's a, actually a really good segue because I personally, I believe that dates are like nature's candy. Like why would you ever need to eat artificial candy when you have dates? I have no idea how this happened because dates are, they're just absolutely amazing. I mean, literally it's nature's candy. Now I'm speaking like a veteran consumer of dates, but the truth is I was averse to dates for many years. Truth be told, they are not the most beautiful things in the world, although now I think they're kind of kind of kind of pretty. Um, but you know, they're brown and they're kind of wrinkled and they're kind of mushy. So I wasn't that attracted to dates for a long time. Plus, I thought they were gonna taste like prunes, so I just avoided them and I turned up my little Irish nose. Until, lo and behold, my husband pushed me just a little too far, challenged me to just try one date. And of course I did. And that was the day I realized that I'm a fool. I'm a fool like so many others. The fool who answers, do you like dates? With no, God, no. Well, have you ever had a date? No, but well, no. You know, like you can't say you don't like something until you try it. And I was one of those people who said that I didn't like dates, even though I had never tried a date. So fool that I was, I got my comeuppance when I tasted how amazingly delicious dates are. And I realized that I had wasted many, many years not eating dates. So I learned my lesson. Now, I still hate cilantro and don't even get me started. I will um, never eat cilantro because I don't like cilantro. And there's a difference between trying something and hating it and not not trying something and saying that you don't like it, okay? So there's a big difference. And don't write to me about how crazy I am not to like cilantro. Apparently, I'm missing an enzyme or something. There are other people out there. In every one of my classes, I ask people if they like cilantro, and there's always my people in the room. Someone in every class also shares my disdain for cilantro. So don't even get me started. Now, again, living in the bubble that I, that I live in, I am very well aware that outside of the Middle East, dates are grown in California in the United States. So during date season, all of the farmers markets around here have entire tables full of various types of dates. The most well-known and popular cultivars are the Deglet Noor and the Majul. 
dates and they're both ridiculously sweet they're just absolutely amazing and it will make you curse artificial sweeteners and candy and all that crap out there that's sold in stores they're it's just amazing Dates are just perfect and natural and sweet and fantastic. Now, medjool dates are the larger ones, and I think they're probably not as available as the smaller dates are, so you may not be able to find them in your local store, but you might. So look for medjool. That's um, M-E-D-J-O-O-L, medjool dates, and you might find the smaller ones, the Diglett Noor or some other ones. But, of course, they all have a large pit in the center, so just be sure to pit them before you eat them or you know, you can just eat them like olives and then spit out the pit before swallowing. And when you get rid of the pit, you can then stuff the date with something like a toasted almond. This is actually a little recipe that I recommend in the cookbook, In the Joy of Vegan Baking. It's hard to call it a recipe, but there you have it. Stick a toasted almond in the center of the date once you remove the pit, or you can stuff it with walnuts. Um, you can stuff it with candied orange peel or marzipan or vegan cream cheese. It's a really simple, delicious, satisfying, sweet, healthful dessert. So use dates as a, um, as a dessert. Incidentally, also in the joy of vegan baking, I have a fig date bread, which I have to say was one of my personal favorites. I tested 150 recipes for that cookbook. So I don't say that lightly. They were a lot of, well, they're all good recipes, obviously. But I would say that the fig date bread would definitely be in my top five. There I am again, making lists. But seriously, it's really fantastic. Now, I was able to determine my favorite desserts by those that I had a hard time giving away. Because once I tested something and made sure it worked and it was yummy, I would literally get the stuff out of the house as soon as possible, I would have gained 50 pounds. So I would share the love and give the desserts to my husband to take to the office or I would give them to my friends and neighbors. And I knew my favorites by those that I had a hard time giving up or by, by, by those I didn't give up. And the fig date bread was one of them. Also my no-bake pecan crust also in the book is, if I may say so, phenomenal and simple and healthful and requires no baking, hence the name no bake. And it's obviously a great crust for fruit based pies, such as the no bake fresh strawberry pie with chocolate chunks, which also contains a sauce made from strawberries and dates. Also in that cookbook, there's um, date bars, which again are fantastic. Like there's an almond butter date smoothie in the cookbook. So there's lots of date based recipes in there. And, and there's so many things you can do with dates. Clearly, I love them. Imagine how empty my cookbook would be if I didn't listen to David. And in my second cookbook, I'll be including date truffles and possibly chocolate covered dates, but you're going to have to wait for that. So, so obviously there's also date sugar, which isn't really a sugar. It's, it's just basically, basically date sugar is made from ground dehydrated dates and it contains all of the vitamins and minerals and fiber found in the fruit. It can also be used in equal parts for sugar in most baking recipes, but because the tiny pieces don't really dissolve. It wouldn't work well as a sweetener for beverages, so you'd want to use it more in baking. And if you find it too sweet using it measure for measure, you can try substituting about two-thirds of a cup of date sugar for each cup of, you know, granulated white sugar or even brown sugar. And you could find date sugar in most uh, local health food stores, or you could even find it in my store, in my Amazon store from CompassionateCooks.com. The other thing I do with dates, I've got more to say about dates, um, which I may have mentioned in my first um, five favorite foods episode, is that I add them to my fruit smoothies. David first turned me on to this. Clearly, he's a date fan, and I poo-pooed it at first, but I was very wrong. I was very, very, so wrong, just wrong. And he was right. It's good to say that once in a while, by the way, if you're married, it's really good to say that you were wrong and they were right once in a while. I was wrong and my husband was right. Anyway, it's true. He was right. And they are, they're amazing in a fruit smoothie. So obviously you would pit them first, take out the pit and just throw a couple of the large medjool dates, maybe a few of the smaller dates in. They're fantastic with blueberries. Um, also, like I said before, in the in the almond butter date smoothie, they're just great with, you know, like cinnamon and almond butter and almond milk, that kind of thing. And they may not puree completely when you're putting them in the smoothie, but I like that because then you're left with these kind of little tiny pieces of the dates, which are chewy. So you get these little bits of dates um, in your smoothie. So definitely consider checking out dates. Our kids are so addicted to crap. You know, growing up, I too was given all of that crap all that candy and 
completely addicted to like refined sugar and corn syrup. And I had no idea that nature provided all of the sweetness that we need. So dates are a wonderful snack for kids. Consider it as candy, you know, like call it candy and use dates the way other families use candy as a treat so that they understand that it really is a candy. It's just natural candy. They're they're just fantastic. I often find though that they are so sweet that I really can't have more than two. It's not like you're going to sit down and have like 15 dates, but they're a great low calorie snack and they'll satisfy your sweet tooth. If you're looking to lose weight, you know, they'll just kind of satisfy the sweet tooth. But if you have a couple, it's only a few calories. So they're good. And like all plant-based foods, they're good for you, full of carbohydrates and vitamins and minerals and amino acids. Yes, dates have protein. So check out dates. They're good. So moving on, I am an equal opportunity nut lover. It's very hard for me to choose my favorite nut, but since you're twisting my arm, I may have to say that my favorite nut is walnuts. I have very fond memories of growing up in a house where we had, especially at parties, like whole walnuts, like, you know, like in the shell. And then we had a little walnut cracker to open them up with, like a nutcracker. And I don't know why I enjoyed that so much, but I have like really fond memories of cracking open the walnuts and having to like pull out the meat, you know, pull out the nut from the thick shell. And I still have that nutcracker, I swear I think it's the nutcracker that I had growing up and I need to get me some unshelled walnuts. I don't know why I do that. You know, it's funny how like we get really nostalgic about things, but don't repeat them in our current lives. Like I'll often talk about how much I love mashed potatoes at Thanksgiving time, but I don't make mashed potatoes a lot during the year. I don't know. Maybe it just really intensifies the anticipation of the mashed potatoes. And so maybe that's what the unshelled walnuts are doing for me. The anticipation is so great, but I actually don't ever eat them. So I'm going to get myself some unshelled walnuts and use my nutcracker. I do eat a lot of walnuts. Actually, actually, I should rephrase that. Of all the nuts I eat, I eat walnuts the most frequently. I probably have about a handful a day, like every day, either in my oatmeal or in my salad at lunchtime. There's nothing like a good, fresh little bowl of, of raw walnuts as a snack or, as I said, like throwing it in something like, like salads or or oatmeal. And I do toast the nuts occasionally, but usually for specific recipes. For the most part, I do think they're best raw. Um, toasting does bring out the flavor a little bit more and you can put like a little bit of salt on them. And they're just a great, just a great little snack. Um, you can even like chop them pretty coarsely and put them on top of soup as a little garnish. Um, so yeah, they're just really versatile. I may have already told you about this, my tempeh walnut stir fry. I think when we talked about tempeh, which would be in that first five favorite foods episode, I talked about the thing that I do with tempeh. I steam the tempeh and then, you know, it's cut into chunks and then I'll fry the tempeh in a little bit of, you know, canola or olive oil. And then I'll also add some broccoli and I'll also add some walnuts. And then I put some tamari soy sauce and some maple syrup, which is fantastic. And so the combination of the tempeh and the walnuts and the broccoli together with the soy sauce and the maple syrup is just fantastic. So that's another way I use the walnuts just kind of in an everyday dish. And then also you can add walnuts to your granola. You can just add walnuts to your non-dairy yogurt. You know, just a couple other ideas. My other favorite way of eating walnuts is through a really fantastic sauce that I make, if I do say so myself. I'm sure I got the recipe from somebody else and I just modified it so I can't take credit for it. But it is a really great sauce that I make pretty frequently. And it's great for something like steamed carrots right or roasted carrots or roasted asparagus or broccoli and it's 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 japanese in essence and it's part of the simple japanese recipe packet that i have on my website and basically you mix raw walnuts this would be done in a food processor you mix raw walnuts with some miso paste some rice vinegar some tamari again some tamari soy sauce and some white wine and you blend these things together in the blender or the food processor 
until you've got this great little sauce and you can make it thick or thin depending on um, how much water you add. You could also add a little bit of water to, to thin it out. And it's just a great sauce for the vegetables that I just named or it would be great over baked tofu, something like that. There's a, also a recipe on my website in probably various packets, recipe packets called a, um, it's a shiitake walnut pate. There's also muhamara. If you've never had muhamara, it's the most fantastic thing ever. It's a roasted red pepper walnut walnut spread and it's divine. It's I believe under one of the Mediterranean packets and I would say that it's one of oh, it's just amazingly fantastic and it's so simple. Again, you would need a food processor or a blender to make it and um and I highly recommend you check it out cuz it's really good. I don't mean to keep teasing you like that. The rest, this recipe, the all of the recipes I'm naming here will be in the next cookbook that I'm working on right now. But at least right now, you can get them on the website through the online cookbook. And there are also a ton of recipes in the Joy of Vegan Baking that either have walnuts as part of the recipe. There's like dried fruit and coconut candies, which is they're a really healthful treat. There's banana walnut muffins. You can use walnuts instead of chocolate chips. There's um, cinnamon coffee cake, baklava, rugelach. Um, there's just walnuts in a lot of recipes and then as options in a lot of recipes. So check out the recipes in the Joy of Vegan Baking. And I have to say, if you haven't taken any time to look at the index, I should say the indices in the cookbook. I was very proud and pleased that the publisher let me write the indices because I didn't want anybody else writing the index for the cookbook. So it's, I think personally, the most comprehensive index you'll ever read. So if you just want, you know, if you have cinnamon and you're like, I want to do something with cinnamon, you can go to the index of the cookbook and it will list every recipe that has cinnamon as a primary ingredient or as a secondary ingredient. You can do the same thing with walnuts. So it'll list every single recipe that has walnuts in it. And then there's also some other indices like um, some suggestions of which recipes can be make, made for different seasons or different occasions like children's birthday parties and that kind of thing. So it's kind of multi-indexed, if you will. And I'm very happy about that because I'm a total index freak and I just can't stand when you open a cookbook you know and the and the index is horrible and it doesn't match anything in the book and you can't find what you're looking for so yeah and um, so just check out the index you could just have fun just reading the index of the joy of vegan baking now, walnuts are not only good in, um, you know, in sweet or savory things. They're really very nutritious just on their own. And I've said before that I don't like making health claims about particular foods, but some foods do deserve a little extra credit. Walnuts would be one of these foods. Now, you remember our conversation about omega-3 fatty acids, right? And I assume you're eating your one tablespoon of ground flax seeds or one teaspoon of flaxseed oil every day. And I better not find out that you're not doing this because we made a deal. You told told me that you were going to do this. So black seeds every day, ground flax seeds every day, but flax seeds are not the only omega-3 stars. Walnuts have a lot of omega-3s as well. A quarter cup or 25 grams of walnuts provides 90, over 90% 90 of the daily value for these essential fats. So walnuts are just a great nut to have around. I buy them in bulk, I store them in my pantry or cupboard and you know you just want to make sure that they're, they're sealed really well and I eat about that much every day probably a quarter cup at most every day and protein lots of protein that same quarter cup that same 25 grams will give you almost four grams of protein and lots of great minerals such as manganese and copper which also aid in the um, antioxidant protection so walnuts are just great add them to your diet and don't even tell me that you don't want to eat them because you're afraid of eating nuts because all of our lives Lives, we've been told as we chew our roast chicken and gobble down our cream doused pasta and slurp our fat laden chocolate shakes that nuts have too much fat and should be avoided. It's bunk. It's a bunch of bunk. So let's stop thinking that way. In fact, recent studies suggest that the consumption of nuts is associated with reduced risk of weight gain. So I don't want to hear it. I, I, I don't want to hear it. Just eat nuts. All right. Now, Oats have also been touted as health food for a long time, and they have withstood the pressure. They are indeed incredibly healthful little buggers, and I love, love, love oats. I love oats. I mean, who doesn't love oats? Who doesn't love oatmeal? Oats have um, gained this reputation because of all the soluble fiber they contain, and they are very high in protein. In fact, oat protein is nearly equivalent in quality to soy protein, and they're also high in many other wonderful nutrients, including 
again, antioxidants like selenium. And of course, like all plant foods, they're low in calories. Now, remember when we talked about fiber, there's an episode called, I don't know, what is it all about fiber probably. And we talked about the difference between soluble and insoluble fiber. Now, I honestly never eat and think, oh, I need to make sure I'm getting insoluble fiber and need to make sure I'm getting soluble fiber. I just eat a variety of good foods. But it's helpful to remember the difference, especially in light of what I said early on in this episode, when you're finding that you're making more frequent trips to the bathroom. It's most likely because of the amount of insoluble fiber that you're eating. The difference has to do with how this fiber acts in our bodies. Soluble fiber forms a gel when mixed with liquid, while insoluble fiber does not. Insoluble fiber passes through our intestines largely intact. You know how oatmeal gets kind of gooey and sticky? That's a characteristic of soluble fiber, whereas insoluble fiber, such as like the skin of fruit or nuts or seeds or leafy greens, you know, they don't get goopy when you cook them, right? Insoluble fiber is just pushing everything through our intestines, which promotes regular bowel movements, prevents constipation. That's why it's helpful in preventing colon cancer, right? And remember, again, there's no fiber, none, zero zilch, no fiber in meat, dairy, or eggs. And we wonder why people are not doing so well on these diets. Soluble fiber, whereas the insoluble just kind of pushes everything through, soluble fiber binds, because of its gelatinous texture, it binds with fatty acids so that sugar is released and absorbed more slowly in our bodies. It helps regulate blood sugar for people with diabetes, and it also lowers cholesterol as well as the LDL cholesterol, the, the not-so-good cholesterol, which means that it reduces the risk of heart disease. And what else can you think of that gets goopy and sticky and gelatinous when you mix it with water? Ground flax seeds, right? That's why they work so well as a binder in baked goods. So flax seeds are a great source of soluble fiber, beans, barley, and of course there's soluble and insoluble fiber in most plant foods, but you know, different ones have higher amounts of, of each. And obviously oats are a really great source of the soluble fiber. Okay. So let's talk briefly about the different types of oats. Now you start off with the oat grain in the hole, in the husk, essentially nature's protection. That's pretty much how it's going to be harvested. It's in its own little husk. Now you remove that husk, that hole, and you're left with the inner portion, the groat, the inner portion. When you remove the hole, is the groat, the oat groat. Okay. Now the outer covering of that groat is the bran. Does that make sense? Okay. So you've got the hole. It's like, it's, you know, think of it like, um, I don't know, think of it like a corn husk. You get rid of the hole and you're left with the, you know, the inside. That's just the groat. And then just the outer covering of that groat is the bran. So once the holes are removed, these groats are sized and separated based on the next step in the process, which is when they're sized again. Using a really sharp mechanical blade, the groats are steel cut into essentially three different sizes. There's coarse, regular, or fine, right? So you've heard of steel cut oats. Well, essentially all of the oats that you're eating, they're all steel cut. But what are sold as steel cut oats are basically just literally the oat groats that have just been chopped in this way with the large mechanical blade. And then they're just sold that way. So they're still in this, you know, in, in their near natural state. You know, it's just the oat groat that's just chopped. So they're nuttier, they're chewier, and they're more nutritious than, say, rolled oats. Now, rolled oats are these steel cut oats, but they've been steamed and they've been rolled and they've been re-steamed and toasted. So those are rolled oats, okay? Now quick cooking rolled oats have been cut into several pieces before being steamed and rolled, all right? Instant oats, they've been pre-cooked and dried before being rolled. That's why they cook so quickly because they've been pre-cooked. Now oatmeal just refers to a meal that's made from crushed, rolled or cut oats. It's just a meal. It just means that you're adding some kind of liquid to it and you're cooking it. And you can use any kind of oats to make oatmeal. Now you've heard of porridge and porridge is pretty similar. It's just the same kind of thing that's made by boiling oats in water 
and non-dairy milk. And in Ireland and Scotland, it's traditional to use steel cut. So when you think of porridge, it pretty much refers to a traditional Irish or Scottish um, oatmeal, essentially, that uses the steel cut oats. Okay. And in England and the US, the you know, rolled oats are typically used, whereas in Ireland and Scotland, they use the steel cut. Now, oat bran, as I said earlier, um, the bran is the outer coating of that groat. And it's usually intact when the oats are rolled or you know, the steel cut oats, etc. But of course, um, it can also be sold separately as bran, as oat bran. Okay, so so that's the difference. That's the that's the oat bran. And so when I make oatmeal, I use mostly rolled oats, but I also use steel cut. Sometimes I'll use quick cooking if I'm just, you know, it depends on how much time I have. Steel cut, the ones that are sold as steel cut oats, means they haven't been rolled. And so it takes a little longer for them to cook, but not, not too much longer. So the different types of oats require slightly different cooking methods for making the hot porridge, the hot cereal, or the, you know, the oatmeal. For all types, Types, it's best to add the oats to cold water or non-dairy milk and then cook at a simmer. The preparation of rolled oats and steel cut oats just require, you know, kind of like two parts of water or, or liquid to one part oats. Rolled oats take approximately 15 minutes to cook, you know, which is why it's so amazing that we're getting all of these quick cooking oats. I mean, 15 minutes, it doesn't take very long. Steel cut oats may take about 30 minutes or a little longer, and you can also put them in a in a slow cooker. If you need to do quick cooking, you know, okay, it's better than nothing. It doesn't take very long. Obviously, you can just pour boiling water over the quick cooking oats. But I do recommend against the prepackaged, already flavored instant oatmeal, you're getting a lot less oats and a lot more sugar, even from the healthier brands. So, and it's more expensive. So just get the oats in bulk, even if it's the quick cooking oats, and then add whatever you want to your to your porridge, to your oatmeal. You can add a little sweetener, like a maple syrup or a brown sugar or agave nectar, even jam. You can add cinnamon, walnuts, apples, strawberries, blueberries, peaches, mangoes, bananas, raisins, dried cherries, dried cranberries, pecans, whatever nuts you like. You can even add a little almond butter or peanut butter. You can top it with soy milk or top it with almond milk or even oat milk. There's commercial oat milk, which is fantastic. Um, or if you like it nice and creamy, you can cook it in any of these milks instead of cooking it in water. The options are endless. And don't forget to add your tablespoon of ground flaxseed, okay? And now, is it better to eat oatmeal um, than cereal, than commercial cereal? Yes. Yes, it is. I realize that cold cereals are convenient. And as long as you're getting the least refined cereals as possible, something like a concentrated brand cereal, like all brand or grape nuts, fine. But if you're asking my opinion, you're better off doing like a hot cereal like like oatmeal. It doesn't take very long and you get you just get so much bang for your buck. It's just really, really it's really a lot healthier for you. Now, people who have celiac disease, people who um, have a hard time digesting or who can't digest just gluten. Research does suggest that oats are fine for people who have celiac um, sprue, celiac disease. Now, some plants process their grains on the same machines as those used for wheat, so that's where it might be a problem. But as far as the grain itself, oats would be considered gluten-free. And of course, oats are great for baking. And again, the joy of vegan baking, I've got jam-filled oat bran muffins, which are really good. Oatmeal raisin cookies, which are, yeah, they're just really good. There's raspberry oatmeal bars, which are really good. And the date bars have oats as well. The chocolate coconut macaroons call for oats. And there's lots of, lots of recipes that call for oats. Again, you can check out the index to see which ones do. My only negative association with oats is one that is luckily lessening a bit, which is good, you know, because oats are used also as a skin moisturizer. I don't know if you remember that stuff called Aveeno. It might still be on the market. I don't know. I've completely blocked it out. But the word Avino, the name Avino, the brand, comes from the fact that the Latin word for the oat plant is Avina sativa. So Avina, Avino, get it? So like Avino is the brand. And that stuff Avino is used to soothe skin. And when I was in my early 20s, I got the chicken pox from a kid that I was sitting for. His parents were going away and I was staying for the weekend. I used to do a lot of full-time childcare in another lifetime when I was in graduate school. And this kid um, was exposed to chicken pox in school and they asked if I had had chicken pox before. So I called my mom and she didn't remember. 
So I um, stayed fully exposed to him for the entire weekend. And lo and behold, not long after that, I came down with a horrible, horrible, horrible case of um, chicken pox. And just to give you an idea of how bad it was all over my body, I had a hundred chicken pox on my face. I counted one day. So I would remember how bad it was. There were a hundred pox on my face alone. And um, I had some friends who were nursing me and they were constantly putting that Aveeno stuff all over me to soothe me. And even now when I smell oatmeal, I still think of that stuff and I shudder. So it's getting better. I'm recovering. I'm recovering from that memory. It's just a bad, bad memory. So the lesson is err on the side of caution. After I got the chicken pox, my mom was like, Oh yeah, that was your sister who had the chicken pox. No, you never did. Thanks, mom. A little late. Okay. Now, finally, the last food I want to talk about is it's kind of related to moms. That's my segue here because moms try to get kids to eat greens and kids usually resist. The problem is that moms also tend to cook these goodies so poorly that kids' resistance to these vegetables is justifiable. I was definitely one of those kids who hated Brussels sprouts, hated them. I couldn't stand the look of them. I couldn't stand the smell of them. And with all due respect for my mom, even though I'm still resentful that she didn't remember that I never had the chicken box, they just weren't cooked well, right? I mean, I guess they were good enough for her and my sister and my dad, I guess, because they ate them, but I didn't like them. And I usually fed them to my dog. So as a formal Brussels sprouts hater, I can tell you that there is no more hate. There is only love and there is hope for anyone who wants to have a new experience with Brussels sprouts. You just have to be open. One of the reasons people tend to turn their noses up literally at such vegetables as Brussels sprouts is because overcooking them releases sulfur compounds in the vegetables and it gives them a very distinctive smell you know, which most people find unpleasant, but if they're correctly cooked, you avoid this unpleasant smell. You really do. So you see, they just have to be prepared correctly. I would say that people also have the same experience to with other, with other members of this cruciferous family, such as cabbage and broccoli and even kale. Asparagus and cauliflower would also fall into these more sulfurous vegetables. And though they're packed with tons of vitamin A and vitamin C and folic acid, acid and fiber, most people are avoiding them because they don't like the smell. Now, it's worth noting that people with sensitive digestive systems may also have trouble with these vegetables, these ones that are more sulfurous. Their sulfur smelling compounds may transfer to um, your own body, if you know what I mean. Some people complain about odorous flatulence from these vegetables. We're all friends here. We can talk about this, right? I mean, I got to tell you, I have to tell you, I would be negligent if I didn't tell you. So, so it's not that these vegetables necessarily increase gas, although for some people they do, it's that the gas is um, more noticeable, more easily detected by the nose. So either eat them while you're alone or feed them to everybody else who's with you. And then nobody would know the difference, but it would be a shame to not eat them because they're so healthful. So I just encourage you to find some kind of happy medium that works for you. My favorite way to prepare Brussels sprouts is to roast them. So you'll most likely buy them already removed from their stock, unless you get them from the farmer's market. It's really fun to buy them when they're right on their stock. So you can see how they grow. So let's assume that they're already removed from the stalk when you buy them. First, you want to just cut off the base along with any remaining stem and just peel away and discard into your compost bin. The outside leaves, they'll kind of automatically loosen up once you cut away the base. Now at this point, I add the little sprouts to a bowl. I drizzle on a little bit of olive oil, not too much. Sprinkle on some salt, press in a few cloves of garlic, and, and I also put some freshly ground pepper in there. And then you just mix it up. I just mix it up by hand. And you transfer them to a cookie sheet or a baking sheet, and then put them in an oven, which has been preheated to about 400 or 425 degrees. Now, for our Thanksgiving class last year, we have a couple roasted Brussels sprouts recipes. Obviously, they're just great on their own like that. But I also have a roasted Brussels sprouts with caramelized onions. And I also have one with onions, apples, and pistachios. I mean, they're really good. 
they're really fantastic great for thanksgiving they're, they are seasonally in the fall but you can tend to find them again out here in california you can find them pretty much several months of the year but you don't have to do much for them to taste good you just roast them for like 20 or 30 minutes maybe 40 depends on the size of the brussels sprouts and it also depends on how brown and crispy you like them you just want to make sure they're kind of soft but not not like mushy you just want to make sure that they're soft to the bite on the inside after they're cooked you just you don't want to eat them raw now when i don't want to put the oven on i i will steam brussels sprouts i like them this way too they need to steam for about 15 minutes again depending on the size and then at that point i'll either just toss them with some earth balance a really fantastic non-dairy butter if you haven't had it before and then, and some salt as well. You can even make a mustard vinaigrette for them. You can use some oil, some balsamic vinegar, some mustard for that. Um, you can squeeze some lemon juice on them with just a little bit of salt. Very simple, very delicious. You don't have to do anything fancy schmancy. Their name comes from the fact that they were grown as early as the 1200s in what is now Belgium, though before that, it's likely that they were cultivated in ancient Rome. And if you want to be accurate, be sure you have to say Brussels sprouts. They're not Brussels sprouts. They're Brussels sprouts. Okay. So that's it. That's a lot. <laughs> so now we have another five favorites, although it's really six favorites with the ginger, but I'll do, I'll do one where I talk about ginger more. So we have another five favorites to add to our first five favorites. The first five favorites was tempeh, kale, quinoa, tea, and blueberries. Remember that? So now we've got carrots, oats, walnuts, dates, and Brussels sprouts. Gotta love them. I mean, you don't have to love them, but I hope you love them. And I just encourage you to at least try to love them. Just <laughs> try. And yeah, we'll definitely continue to feature more favorites. You can bank on it. So in the meantime, enjoy your vegetables. Enjoy your grains, your nuts, your seeds, your beans, your herbs, your spices, your mushrooms. For the animals, this is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening.